Ladies and gentlemen, I will ask that you all take your seats, please. We're about to go live. Ladies and gentlemen, if everyone could take their seats, we're about to go live. Ladies and gentlemen, can you take your seats? We're about to go live, okay? All right, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We're about to go live. Michelle, Senator Taylor, could you take your seats, please? Since y'all just gonna make me say names, you know, I will, you know. Milwaukee's own Al Jarreau right there. Present to you the Hustle and Grow team with Anita the Three Pointer. Summer, the Stanford Scholar. <laughs> Here and last but not least, Naomi, the artist. How are you doing? All right. Okay. Um, so I think first we should explain um, our brand name. So I'm gonna go first. I'm Naomi the artist, and the reason why is because I'm a very creative person, and I consider myself an artist. Um, I'm Anita the Three Pointer. I chose this name because while I'm always on the court, I um. I always like make more threes than twos. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm 
summer the Stanford Scholar, but um, I'm actually going to pause in the statement because I'm going to um, explain that further later on in the show. Okay, so our first guest, we have phenomenal woman, Senator Lena Taylor. Hello, hello, Hi. hello. Good afternoon, Senator Taylor. Um, so we're gonna start with our first question. When you were young, what was some of your original dreams? Wow. When I was young, I'm thinking of Lena. I got, look, I gotta close my eyes to think back that far, y'all. Um, seriously though, I'm thinking about the 11 year old Lena who was working in my grandmother's grocery store and my mother's restaurant. And I frankly was just hoping to make more than penny candy, um, even though I was doing real good with the penny candy thing. Um, I didn't really, if I could be honest with you, I wasn't dreaming about um, anything that I'm really doing now, right? Um, Back then, just working in the family's restaurant was what I wanted. And it was on 29th and North Avenue. And um, as I saw uh, and heard about things, you know, like I heard about this guy that was called Blondie. He was a police officer. And I heard about what was happening in the community with him. And I wanted to become a lawyer because I then wanted to be able to help clean up what I was seeing happening on what was called the strip. Uh, so food was a major portion of my life and feeding people and serving people. Um, so the first thing I can remember is wanting to be a lawyer so that I could help to clean up things. And um, it was, you know, many, many, of course, years later that that ended up happening. I didn't have any idea the connection on how I was gonna become a lawyer in order to do those things. But those were some of my first dreams, um, was to be a lawyer. And before that, probably, you know, a teacher, because I was always doing stuff with the kids in the neighborhood, making up a little um, fair in my backyard, doing stuff like that. You were a lawyer at first, so how did you become senator afterwards? So I was a lawyer practicing law for not quite a decade, and it was one, a guy I went to high school with um, who was a state representative. His name is uh, Leon Young. He was the person who encouraged me to run for state representative because I wanted to be an alder person. I wanted to be just like the person that I had watched serve our community, um, made our streets look great, everybody loved him. You all know him. Yeah. Our mayor, our county executive, Marvin Pratt. He was my alderman. He's what I saw as leadership and the example of what I saw as service. And um, when Marvin said that he was uh, not going to run, I'm like, I'm gonna run for alderman. And it was Leon Young who said, you know, being a state representative really aligns more with your law degree. You know, and I was like, really, what does state rep do? <laughs> and that was the beginning <laughs> of me looking into be running for state representative. And I was like, that makes sense. Leon is right, mama. And I ended up running for state representative. And nine months later, running for re-election for state representative. And nine months later, running for senator behind Gwen Moore, who is now our congressperson. Wow. Yes. And what has been your biggest challenge as senator, and how have you overcome it? Oh, my. Ooh. <laughs> mm. Mm. It's two big challenges. One, the people in Madison. It can be a challenge on both sides of the aisle, if I can be honest. 
And the lack of understanding of process in our community, the need in our community is so great. And so how do we overcome it? Working overtime. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say, working overtime, trying to um, be the voice to help people understand civics, trying to be the bridge between my community and Madison, trying to be the bridge between being on one side of the aisle and people being on the other side of the aisle. So literally just rolling up my sleeves and trying to just do that work to help people be more informed. Um, to try to be what I said I wanted to be, which was the bridge between the community and government and help people navigate that. Um, and I'm gonna tell you that that can be draining. And so I don't know if I've overcome it. I don't know if I've, you know, solved, uh, all, of course we've not solved the problems, but um, just every day trying to help one more person be more informed. And moments like this, can I say, are encouraging. Because talking to young people so that they can look at me and say, well, wow, if you're a state senator, I'm only the fifth African American when I got sworn in to be a state senator. I'm only the second black girl to be a state senator when I got sworn in. There have been two since me, um, women and one man and one Republican. And so it is, um, exciting when I can be among young people and you can see that if I can do it, you can do it, that there's somebody that's called a senator, that somebody's a senator that looks like you, you know, that's the stuff that motivates me. That's the stuff that says, okay, we can close the gap. Just keep trying. And did you have a lot of support while getting through those challenges? Oh man, my ace boom coon, um, the one that sound like me, even um, though we totally different, uh, y'all just don't know, Michelle Bryant. That's been a huge support for me. Having a staff person who is as passionate about serving the community as I am makes it so much easier. Someone who, when someone calls or emails our office with a constituent issue, having that kind of support in the office, on the team, is crucial. But the community has been amazing. And I think the, the, the election that will forever be an example of showing that the support runs deep is um, back in my re-election in whatever year that was, I can't even remember now, 2015, 16, um, when redistricting, or whatever, whenever it was, but when redistricting, after redistricting it happened, um, it was a shocker to see just the number of people that came out to show support um, when the districts had been changed and, um, and the love, the love that um, people have shown over the course of years. And, um, and I'll end with this. There was a woman um, who said something to me early on in my career being an elected official. She said, you need to have receipts. And I was like, receipts? It's like proof, right? You know, like you can't take nothing back to the store, right, if you don't have a receipt, right? Having receipts, showing up for people, being there, helping to solve problems, and that's why I started with having a staff wow. person and staff a team. Michelle and I haven't done it alone. We've had interns and other people who have worked in the office but having people who do the work, because I can't do it all as the senator, right? I can't answer every call, I can't answer every email, I can't go to every event. And so having people who do that work, that's the support that creates the receipts that make for the support that shows up in elections. Great, <laughs> yeah. So is there anything that you would want to do after becoming a senator? That's a really good question. <laughs> I actually um, always knew at some point I'd like to dust off that law degree of mine and put it to use again. And I'd like to sit on the bench and become a judge. And so ironically, I just announced yesterday 
that I'm running for municipal court judge. And so that's my next. That's my next. Thank you. Okay, so what advice would you give a young person who wanted to enter politics? So the first thing I'd say is before you run, start with just participating and volunteering in an office, um, participating and going to committee meetings or you know, being a part of something in your community. You don't have to be elected to make a difference. But if you want to be an elected person, I really encourage you to start there. Learn the, the, learn the craft. Learn a little bit about it. You know, that's like somebody saying they want to just go into journalism and they don't never, ever do what you do. You know, learning to interview people and participating is it, not as easy as people think it is, is it? To just do a show. You got you to gotta do your research and get your script and all that kind of stuff. Well, I encourage you to do the same thing if it, being elected is something you think you want to do. And, um, and it's not hard to get involved. Even the state senate office takes volunteers, interns. We take folks in high school. We take folks in college. We take folks that are retired, hint, hint, out in the audience. We take it all. <laughs> because in the end, there's more, there's more need than it is us, right, to be able to do it. And, and I'll end with this. No matter what it is that you want to do or be, I encourage you to start always with your research. Start always with learning about it and then going from there. A few weeks ago, you mentioned something about programs around agriculture. Could you briefly explain? Oh my goodness, I'm so glad you asked because that's my favorite topic, y'all, agriculture. And the reason it is is because of how healing, how transformational I believe it can be for our community. And what I brought up previously when we were together are the scholarships that are available in agriculture. Um, any parents out here with young people that are gonna go to college or interested in college? All right, well you wanna know about the 1890 scholarships. These are scholarships, so if someone wants to be like like Miss Lisa, and they want to be an ag, have an ag business because that's what she has. Did you enjoy your food today? That's an ag business. And so, if you want to do culinary, like Miss Lisa, or if you want to, um, someone asked me about going to their uh, family's farm if they want to farm or grow things. Uh, if someone knows someone who is on, has diabetes or high blood pressure, one of the first things that the doctor tells you is that you need to eat differently, right? Dietitian and nutritionists help with that. Those 1890 scholarships are to historical black colleges. Four years tuition, room, board, so where you eat and, what you and where you sleep, and um, room, board, books, fees, a paid internship, and a job with benefits in the end, but you got to major in, guess what? Agriculture. And so that is huge to be able to have that opportunity to go to a HBCU, to be able to get scholarships. And then there was the 1994 USDA scholarships, which are to tribal colleges, and we have two tribal colleges in our state, the Menominee and Lacta Flambeau. So I love telling people about those scholarships because the opportunities that exist in agriculture, it's like a never ending blooming onion, I like to say. There's always so many things that you can do. So that's some of the information that I shared. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Senator Lena Taylor. We appreciate your time, talent, and treasures today. Thank you for having me. I'm so proud of you ladies. You keep doing what you're doing, and I know one day you're going to be the Doug Kellys helping to, you know, do advertisement at a radio station, or you're going to be the Michelle Bryants that are the voice on the radio. Uh, and at the very least, 
you're going to build confidence to be able to do what a lot of people are sometimes afraid to do, which is to speak in front of a group of people. Thank you. Bless I appreciate you all. it. You too. Okay, so now we are going to interview my sister, Summer Laster. Um, so Summer, earlier we did not talk about your branding, but what is this Summer the Stanford Scholar? Um, I, I have named myself Summer the Stanford Scholar as my brand because um, where I go to for high school is called Stanford Online High School, and it's founded by Stanford University in 2006. So that, yeah, that was the inspiration for my brand name. Um, how did you get connected um, to this school? Yeah, so um, first thing, I just, it happened to be like a letter that I got um, sent to me. And at first I didn't know like what it was about, but it was like ask, suggesting that I apply to Stanford um, Online High School. And so I just eventually did it because like my mom suggested it. And at first I didn't really, I didn't know like how it was gonna end up, but then I like, I got nervous when I found out that it was one of the top high schools in the world, really because it was founded by one of the top universities in the world. So. And then are you like young, one of the youngest people in your class or is there like? Um, no, I, I was gonna be the youngest people in my class, but um, the high school that I go to, they like strive for people to graduate at like older ages, like 17 and 18. So instead they um, made me retake eighth grade. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that sucks. Um, so like how was the workload at school? It's definitely, um, it's not as hard as I expected, except for like maybe when you get later on into the year when the, it's really the, how difficult the material is. And um, the assignments, they're, they're at a, like, they're due at like a really good date, but it's just the material that's very hard to understand, which is like why they offer like tutoring with not only professionals, but they also offer it with like kids who are like on the honor roll stuff. And since you're doing school online, do you find it more difficult than being in person or? Um, no, um, not really. I feel like there's, maybe when you're a person, um, I guess you can have like more communication with like the, um, the staff there, but also like when you're online, you have like more time to yourself or you can just um, work at your own pace, I guess. Have you ever been to the university? Actually, I've been there recently, um, like a few months ago in August. Um, it was like a camp there where we went there um, and we studied at the university and I, like, I took a few courses. I think one was like about like, um, Greek related, and then the other one was uh, um, a language course. Did you spend the night like at the school too, like on campus? Um, it wasn't on campus, but like there were, um, there were like houses, I guess, that were reserved for um, people who were staying there. And they had dorms and stuff like that. Oh, that's nice. Um, so are you planning to go to the Stanford University College? It's definitely on my list, um, along with like other Ivy League colleges. And um, I actually wouldn't mind um, to be like a college, maybe like a HBCU college either, but um, I, would I would also like consider going here, definitely. All right, thank you, Summer. We wish you great success. Thank you. Yeah.
Our next individual is very well known as a community and political activist. She is always asking the tough questions of others, but today we get a chance to ask her what everyone wants to ask. The host of Say Something Real on WNOV Radio, Miss Michelle Bryant. Good afternoon. What's happening? How y'all doing? Good. Good. So, of all interviews you have done, what has been your favorite? Ah. Uh, so, when Hillary Clinton ran for office in 2016 um, against Donald Trump, uh, they sent a surrogate to the radio station, or had a surrogate call the radio station. I don't know if you've ever seen the show. You guys are kind of young, but living single. The lady who plays Max, um, Erica Alexander, she called in uh, to the station and we did a amazing interview in which she talked about why she was supporting Hillary Clinton, but it was so funny because I had grown up watching her television show. I kept calling her Max through the interview and uh, she was just cracking up and she was like, I, I give, everybody calls me that. But just understanding the other side of folks and why they get engaged and why they get involved, it was super cool. So that was one of my, my favorite interviews. <laughs> Who has been your worst? <laughs> <laughs> so, so many. Um, <laughs> you know, the one thing I will say is that if you like talking to people and you're willing to keep asking questions, you can usually pull a good interview out of folks. Um, it's just really about listening and you'll hear that little nugget, that little thing that they say that you can tell that their eyes light up about it when they're talking about it or you can hear something in their voice. So I think I'm pretty fortunate that I've been able to talk to anybody about anything and can usually figure out a way to make it an interesting interview. But you guys know, as folks who interview people, the folks who have like real short answers, just one-liners, those are some tough interviews. That makes sense. <laughs> And do you remember like one of your first interviews and how you kind of like improved from there? Ooh, first interview. So for folks that don't know me, uh, I am not someone with a journalism background. I actually uh, am a history um, major and I work in politics. And, but I was someone who called in the local talk radio all the time. Eric Vaughn, who was a big personality on W uh, MCS 1290 and then 860. I used to call and challenge Eric all the time and we would go back and forth. And so I started because he eventually invited me in, like, yeah, Miss Big Mouth, uh, you wanna talk, come on in and let's go toe to toe. And so Eric and I uh, started doing a weekly segment. And so that's actually how I got into this game. When Eric passed away, um, I actually was uh, brought in to, cause I was already doing a show part-time. So I was, I, brought, I was brought in to do the morning. So. I always like to give people that backstory that I'm not a journalist. I stumbled into this. Uh, first interview, first interview. I don't remember my first interview. That's crazy. Um, I do not remember my first interview. You've done quite a lot, so <laughs> I understand. You saying I'm old? What are you? I mean, it's not like no, you're saying no, that's like no, really no, old. No, 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 you just oh, have okay. a lot of experience. Because I, I heard y'all call Sydney Taylor old. <laughs> you like to interview that you have not interviewed? Hmm. Living or, or deceased? <laughs> I guess they have to be living, huh? Probably. Uh, because I, I've always said if I could do both, you know, if, there, if there's someone I could interview that has transitioned life, uh, it would definitely have to be Mary McLeod Bethune. Um, and Thurgood Marshall. Those would be my two, if I could, interview. Um, people that I would love to interview today would probably be Deion Sanders, because of the controversy that's happening right now, and um, Barack Obama. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those are some good ones, yeah. But uh, if there are people who have passed on, mm -hmm. um, do you know anybody like 
who you would interview? That I would interview? Yeah, that has been. Again, you know, just, so the question you guys asked Senator Taylor about when she was growing up, what did she want to be? So when I grew up, I actually wanted to be a lawyer. Um, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, but was raised in New York. I always like to tell people I got the best of both worlds, Southern pragmatism, but Northern tenacity. And my parents were huge in the civil rights movement. My grandparents, um, when they were planning, uh, doing some of the planning for the um, Edmund Pettus Bridge March, um, Bloody Sunday, that John Lewis, um, the iconic photos from that, um, some of those meetings actually happened at my great grandfather's home, um, Pastor Isaiah Sanders. And so I was just embedded in the civil rights movement. I always knew that I wanted to be a lawyer. But then as I got older, it seemed like a lot of the big cases had been settled. You know, so we had kids could go to school with anybody, integration, you know, had happened. Um, women had, you know, a lot of rights that they didn't have before. So it seemed like a lot of the big issues were settled. And then now, only to find out that a lot of the things that were important to me when I first, you know, started middle school and high school, all those things are back on the table. You know, no matter what you think about a woman's right to choose, that was decided 50 years ago. It's back on the table. Voting rights, I tell people all the time, I am older than the right of African Americans to vote unencumbered in this country. What do I mean by that? I'm 58 years old. I know I look good, thank you, I saw your face. But the 1965 Voting Rights Act, 57 years ago, I as a black woman could not go into a polling location and vote without somebody giving me a literacy test. You know, making me say how many jelly beans are in that jar, what they call poll taxes. Black men had the right to vote long before black women, but as a black woman, I'm older than, than the right to vote, um, and that blows me away. And the fact that we are still debating voting rights and voting suppression and people that, you know, look at what they did down in Georgia when, you know, they closed all these polling locations, what we did in Milwaukee uh, during the mayoral election when Senator Taylor ran for mayor, we normally had 180 polling locations. The largest city in the state of Wisconsin, we only had five polling locations open. Wauwatosa had more polling locations than the city of Milwaukee. I did not think that we would be fighting some of these same issues. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, like should we brighten the mood a little bit? Um, like after like all your experience of like being on the radio, would you like to start your own radio show? Um, hmm. So, having done two radio shows at one time, I used okay. to do morning drive and afternoon drive uh, for a period of time. Uh, I've talked about, and a lot, a lot of people have talked about going um, to syndication, to you know, doing a national show. And so that's somewhere in the atmosphere, um, whether or not I will do a, a show on Sirius XM. I'm friends with a couple of folks that host their own shows on the, that platform. So it's something that I, I, I consider. Yeah. And why have you done radio for a while and do you think like you'll continue doing that? Similar to some of the stuff that Senator Taylor said, and she didn't say this, I'll say it. Lena and I actually went to college together. Um, we met because we were actually protesting, um, uh, well, it was around Nelson Mandela, but getting companies to divestiture, that's the word I'm looking for, to divest in South Africa. And so we were at UWM's campus, um, and that's how we met, actually, because we were involved in those protests. Um, so I've always been somebody that was aware that, you know, I had a voice, I had a responsibility to use my voice to help others, to help myself, uh, to help my community. And so it's just one of those things that, you know, you, you always wanted to do. So that's one of the reasons why I started calling talk radio is because I wanted to, I, people have always said, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Um, I always wanted to have a say. Uh, I always believed that, you know, you should be involved. And the reason I continue to talk radio is because I think it's just important, number one, that women's voices are out there. And if you've looked at talk radio traditionally, it's been a lot of men, particularly in the Milwaukee market. 
Um, and in terms of black women, it's been very few. So what you guys are doing, to Senator Taylor's point, amazing, because there are not a ton. Um, but I just always thought I want to be someone, I, I do a fairly good job of taking really big issues and breaking them down into a way that um, anyone can understand. When I was in school, I had a teacher. I wrote this paper. It was an amazing paper. It's like, this is an A paper. And I got the paper back, and my teacher had just marked it all up and bled all over the paper with a red marker. And I was like, what? You know, a little confident, because it was an A paper. And she said, Michelle, I see you as someone who will talk to people all over the world. And I love the, the look you had. That's the same look I had, like, whatever. And um, she said, I need you to use words that everybody can understand. Some people have $10. The majority of people have at least a dollar. So bring those words down a bit. I'm glad, you know, you got all of that on display. But bring those words down a bit so that everybody that you interact with can understand what you need them to understand. So there are people that I listen to, like, I'll, does anybody know Michael Eric Dyson? I love Michael Eric Dyson. But his words are so big that half the time you lose the message because the words are so big. And you are looking on your phone to figure out what that meant. So um, I just always wanted to be able to communicate with people, get information to the community, and figure out how to be of help. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So besides Milwaukee, where have you lived and what's the biggest difference between those places politically? Um, I've lived in about seven states. Uh, when I first came to Milwaukee, I came because I was married. My husband worked for Miller Brewing Company. Um, prior to getting married, I had already lived in Kansas, and I was raised in New York, and uh, spent um, every summer in Birmingham. Um, but I've lived in California. I've lived in Kansas City. Um, I've lived um, uh, Missouri. So I've lived in a number of places because his job, we traveled a lot. Um, and what's the second half of that? Uh, what are the biggest difference? Biggest differences. Uh, yeah. First, oh, and I've lived in Georgia. First things I always tell people, you know, because I'm not from Wisconsin, and it took me forever to claim Milwaukee as home because I was always like, I'm leaving, I'm moving, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. Um, but the minute you go somewhere else and you ride in five and six lanes of traffic, you appreciate Milwaukee so much, um, the cost of living, even though I know a lot of people struggle with housing insecurity here, it is still a relatively affordable place to live. And the idea that like in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and in Wisconsin period, we have just about every athletic sports team you could have. We are five minutes from the Brewers, the Bucks, you know, hockey. It's like crazy. It's, so if you are a person who likes to do things, it really is a cool city to live in. And the other thing I'll just quickly say is, I've said this to people, if you're someone who wants to make a name for yourself, who wants to be a player, who wants to be a part of things, this is a town that's relatively easy, at least the way I see it, to get engaged. People will bring you in, people will open the doors. You know, people um, are not so territorial that they push you out. So those are the things I like about the city. What are some similarities? Um, in some places, the racial segregation, um, the situation with African Americans in housing, you know, housing for black folks is abysmal in this town. Uh, during the banking crisis, we took the, the hardest brunt of it. And, you know, quality education, tends to still be a concern, I don't care where you go. Um, if you don't have the money to get your child into certain kinds of schools, you really have to fight to make sure your child gets a good um, public education. Because just like here in Wisconsin, particularly here in Milwaukee, there are probably four or five really good public high schools and everybody's fighting to get their child in King, in Reagan, in Riverside. Um, there are two others I can't think of right now. Go to my year. Go to my year, yeah. you know, and you know, so, those kinds of issues though. So I think the fact that race is still an issue, I don't care where I go, um, is some of the things that are the negative sides of that. 
And um, do you have a passion for running for a political office again? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, so I actually did run for political office. Um, I live in the sixth Senate district. Um, and uh, I forgot, maybe that was 2020. Um, but I was really frustrated by a number of things that was happening in our district. Uh, some people will know that I was very vocal when um, Mayor Barrett announced that they were going to move a slaughterhouse um, on 35th and Capitol. And I lived at that time in the Sherman Park area. And I was vehemently against someone putting a slaughterhouse on 35th and Capitol. And you know, I got roasted in the media, Mark Bellin, it was just so, it was just so much. Um, we need jobs, we need jobs. And I was like, first of all, tell the truth to the community when you tell people that 250 jobs are coming to this community, but 230 of them were already occupied by the people who work for the organization. So I didn't like the way I was hearing people lie to the community about the possibilities just to score political points. So I decided to run for office um, because the senator at the time I didn't feel like she was being very vocal. And there were, this was like the third big thing that had happened that finally was like, okay, enough is enough. And so I got in at the very last minute. Um, anybody that's ever been in a campaign, you need money, you need time to plan. And it was more a statement for me that I just wanted to keep people on their toes. Um, but would I run for office, you know, big picture? Probably so. Um, I think it's important. Somebody has to step up and do it. The thing that I, I feel bad, though, is that, you know, this guy decides he wants to run for office. People will make it their business to find every little thing he's ever done that's wrong, every little decision that's questionable, and they will just strip you down. So what it takes to run for office, you know, is a lot. But I'm super proud. I um, read and talked about on my show a young man ran for office, he is the mayor of Earl, Arkansas. He is 18 years old, 18 years old. Yes, that's crazy. So he graduated from high school in May, he became the mayor in November, and he's in college. So you gotta run for office. <laughs> so back to what you said before, um, do you feel like things that people have done that's negative overthrows what they've done that's positive in politics? I think most people that come to politics come for the right reason. Mm -hmm. You know, you gotta have a certain type of personality to run for office. You gotta have, there's a certain level of type A, I don't know if everybody understands type A personality, but you gotta really believe in yourself, really believe I can sway people, get people to see things my way, you know, change the outcome of a vote or a decision. So you, you gotta have a certain amount of uh, just a little bit of ego <laughs> coming through the door. But I think that's too often people get caught up in the trappings of being an elected official because the power is crazy. It just, it, it is. You know, um, you get access. I was just laughing the other day, an email came and um, it said uh, you were invited to the White House Christmas reception. And my name is mistakenly on the leadership's email, so everything that comes to leadership comes to me. And I'm like, really? I get to go to the White House to the Christmas reception? You get to go to the White House for the Super Bowl party? I mean, it's like crazy opportunity. Um, and there are some people, they forget why they came. And you start doing like a lot of stuff that's just not in the best interest of people. You're just trying to keep your seat. You want to continue to get invited to hang out with the president or, you know, have special access. And um, so there are times when the negatives can certainly outweigh the positives. But I'm going to just say this real quick. The days when you realize that you thought of a bill or you saw something that was really, really wrong and you said, we should introduce legislation to change that or make that better and that bill passes, when you realize I had a hand in creating law, best feeling in the world. 
you like, oh my God. And you know, I'll just say this one, and you know, I know you said you wanted to lighten the mood. Um, yeah, good luck with me. But there was, there was this story that we saw um, on Good Morning America. And it's a, it's a grimy story, so I won't do the details, but the whole concept was that a member of law enforcement should not be able to have inappropriate physical contact, because I know we got some babies in here, physical contact with a person in custody. And I came to Senator Taylor and I said, this should be a law. Because Wisconsin was one of only five states that didn't have a law in the books that said that an officer cannot have physical inappropriate contact with a detainee. Senator Taylor said, go for it, do it. We introduced it, no brainer, right? Everybody's gonna come on board. Law enforcement fought a tooth and nail. Seriously, seriously? So it came back around second session. We were able to get the law passed. And there is a horrific case that just was talked about in the media in another state in which a law enforcement officer took advantage of a number of women of color. And had that person been in Wisconsin, there are actual legal repercussions. Because in the state of New York, the officer said it was consensual. The jury believed it. End of story. This young 18-year-old girl that these officers attacked, she had nowhere to go. And so because we were at the table in the room, we were able to change it so that no person in Wisconsin could ever have that happen to them and they didn't have legal recourse. When you felt like giving up, what motivated you to keep pushing? <sighs> So the question was, if you've ever felt like giving up, what motivated you to keep going, what pushed you? Um, two things. Uh, number one, when I graduated from high school, I found out that I was um, about to have a child. I was three months pregnant when I graduated from high school. So having someone else depend on me, um, basically most of my adult life, I didn't really have an option not to keep going because if I failed, my son didn't eat. If I failed, my son didn't get you know, a good education. He didn't get access. So that was one, if I could just be honest, was my family. But the other thing, um, and this is where knowing your history is so important. I've always understood because of my grandparents and my parents what it meant to be black in America the struggle, you know, when you think about how we came to this country and the things that people had to endure, we, by all accounts, are not supposed to be here. When you think about the abuse and the beatings and, you know, the conditions that we lived under. And so every time I think it's really hard, I think about what it must have been like to be alive in 1865, or 1840, or 1600, 1700, you know, when people were being brought here and living in the way that they were. And that's what always, it changes my attitude quick, fast, and in a hurry. When I start complaining, because I understand that history, I suck it up real fast. All right, thank you for that. Do you have any closing comments? Um, I think I want to echo what Senator Taylor said, how important what you all are doing is. I've had an opportunity to watch you grow. Um, I've been super proud, like a mom on some ends. I've seen kids come and go in the program. I've seen people that were very shy become amazing, effective public speakers. And so I just want to congratulate you all, first of all, for wanting this for yourself. You know. Um, understanding how it changes things and how being a part of stuff like this. My son, he used to be on Team Form, and when he graduated from college, that was um, done on Channel 12. Uh, when he graduated from college, he went to go work for ESPN. And it was the experience that he got as a high school student doing this kind of stuff every week that when he submitted his resume, he was already a step above his peers. The things that you all are doing now are putting you a step above your peers right now. 
So I just want to say to the people that have made this possible, thank you. To the parents who have supported your babies, thank you. Um, and to the folks that work hard to make sure that Radonna's um, vision for this um, has, has sustained. So that's it. Thank you so yeah, thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. I thought y'all was gonna have some hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for constantly and always informing our community. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. You too. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time today and thank you for constantly and always informing our community. Next, we have a gentleman who has been through the Center for Teaching and Entrepreneurship Programs, graduated from college and now sits on the board of directors for the organization, Mr. Ryan Gray. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon and thank you for coming. Um, so why did you get involved with CTE as a young person? Good afternoon and you all are doing a great job, by the way. Aren't they doing a great job? <laughs> Sometimes sitting in front of people can be very nerve wracking. Um, how I got a part of CTE, is that what your question was? Mm -hmm. um, so I was at the AfroFest, I believe it's called, well, when we had it. And um, me and my mom was just walking, going somewhere in the festival and we came across a table. And one of the uh, women at the time, Ms. Taiyi, she said, you know, do you want to have a business? And you know, I said, well, I'm too young. Well, you're never too young to have a business and all these things. And so I said, well, I think I'm interested. And um, I got the information. And once I got the information, uh, me and my mama looked at it and we were very intrigued at what we saw. And so once we went to CTE for the first time, um, the first face we saw actually was Ms. Radonna. And for those who know Ms. Radonna, she had a bright smile and she had her very energetic personality. And from there, we already knew, you know, that's where we wanted to be. Thank you. What college did you attend? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I attended the Alabama A&M University in Huntsville, or what we call normal Alabama. And how was that experience for you? That experience was amazing. So I had the opportunity to be a part of a historical black, historical black college, uh, well, university for us. Um, very good, very rich with culture. Um, contrary to belief, all black people are not the same. <laughs> and so with that, we got to see, I had to see so many people that look like me, but were not me. And it was different personalities, different cultures, different backgrounds, different experiences. And I was able to learn from a many of them um, and even understanding the culture of an HBCU. If you've ever been a part of it and even been on a campus, nothing compares to it. So the rich education, but the rich experience as well that gives you the, really gives you the assurance of a person and even being black in America. So it was a great opportunity, great experience. What life skills did you learn from that college? Life skills I learned from that college, I would think is to be unashamedly black. Um, I've had the opportunity to intern in some of the most prestigious companies before I actually got hired to where I am now. Um, Wells Fargo, other um, companies here. And in many times, I was the only African American um, there. And that was just an intern, so there were no other employees that looked like me. And sometimes when you're the minority in a situation, it can be a very intimidating experience. And sometimes you say, am I doing enough? Am I not doing enough? Um, am, I, am I enough? Am, and where I am, is that okay? And so being in college, it taught me you are enough, you are educated, you have the experience, and show them what you're worth. 
Um, and why did you come back as a ST? I mean, why did you come back as a CTE? Why did you come back to CTE as an adult? Sorry. Great, um, great question. So to give you a little bit of background, when I started CTE, I was um, 12 years old. Later that year, I opened my own business called Blessings on Enterprises that I had at least for five to six years. And within that, within that business, I was selling um, Christian merchandise. So I helped with a um, Christian board game that was like a monopoly. And then we also developed other merchandise. And there we went through many churches and we were able to help churches provide a fun and exciting way and providing information to what they taught their members, which was the gospel of Jesus Christ for their congregations. And I wouldn't have had that experience without CTE. Um, I was able to go through many places, even in the country, and talk about my experience as a young entrepreneur. I was featured in a uh, magazine within the Midwest as the youngest entrepreneur at that time because of CTE. I was able to have good speaking skills because of CTE. And so how dare I not receive, how dare I receive so much information and then not come back to Milwaukee as a professional and not give my experience and not give my ability to help the, young, the next generation. So um, what is your current career position my current career position, um, I'm currently at Quad. I work within business solutions as a project coordinator. So my job in so many ways is just to make sure that things get done. Um, so as of right now, um, one of our clients, my job is to make sure that as it pertains to the marketing aspect, which is my background, is to make sure that the things are executed in the most effective way possible. And so sometimes um, the things that are on the billboards, the things that are on the, the buses or what have you, my job is to make sure those things are there. And if it's not, then my job is to ask us to the tough questions, why and what happened to the timing that we weren't able to execute this in the time agreed. Um, do you have any closing comments? Oh, that was quick. Okay. <laughs> um, my closing comments would be to you all, you three, and that is you can do whatever you want to do. Um, whatever you're starting to do right now, it may look totally different. So um, when I started CTE, I was in the Christian um, business um, aspect at that time. But now I have um, at least two businesses under my belt that are totally different than what, I'm start what I started with and that is graphic design and interior design. Um, two totally different things, Refined Graphics and The Great Collective that uh, me and my wife are the co-founders of. And it's different, but it started, but the start that I had at CTE got me to where I am today. Um, and so all I tell you is never, um, the Bible says in so many words, never despise small beginnings. So where you are right now is very critical and very crucial to understand that it's taking you to where you want to go. It's okay if you don't have all the answers. It's okay if you don't understand where you're going, but just take one step at a time. Don't beat yourself up. It's okay to breathe. Um, I bought my first home at 25, and I remember... Um, you know, thinking my credit wasn't good enough. I mean, it was good, but you know, I was just nervous and frustrated and all of these things that I spoke to someone. And she said, you can breathe. You're putting too much on yourself. Breathe, everything will be okay. And that's what I wanna tell you. It's okay to have so many goals, but don't be so consumed by the next phase in life that you forget to breathe and enjoy where you are. Because the mere fact that you're doing what you're doing is a success. You are a part of Stanford. You're a part of a basketball organization. You're a part of making sure that these ladies know what they're doing. I think they're doing an amazing job. What do you think? So I say that to say is, you may not even know what you're going to do in the next 10 years. But be okay with where you are now. Because where you are now is a great start. Thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate all your advice. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to bring to you
the executive producer of the Hustle and Grow Show and president of the board of directors for the Center for Teaching Entrepreneurship, Mr. Douglas Kelly. Good evening, good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Woo. We're finally here. Uh, first, let's give the Hustle and Grow team a nice round of applause. Also, let's give uh, Lisa K. Catering. Uh, she provided the uh, food. So the, um, the cupcakes that are on the uh, tables was actually done by her youth culinary education program. The young kids did the cupcakes for us, so let's give them a nice round of applause. So, I got a long list, I'll make it quick. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Milwaukee County of Equity, PNC Bank, and a new sponsor, the Buckta family. Probably a lot of you are wondering, who in the, is this guy? across from that queen. This is actually Frank Buckta, who actually co-founded the organization with Radana in 1990. Yes, uh, we reunited uh, with the family earlier this year. Uh, he left us money in his will. Yes, uh, he had passed in 1995 but the uh, will became <clears throat> activated once his wife died, and his wife died in December. And so the uh, sons had uh, called me and gave me the great news, and so it was, it was, really, it was really good to uh, know that he felt that way about the organization. Um, so Radana met him in 1990, and they started the organization. Um, and over the years, you know, CT has had its issues. We've had our struggles. Uh, but I'm here to say that, you know, we're, we're back in stride again, as one of my models are. But there's no I in team. Uh, so I would like to take this time to introduce my board of directors. <clears throat> uh, Mary, executive director of Granville Bid. Ryan, project coordinator at Quad Graphics. Diana professional coach and retired executive from uh, Miller. Charles, I think Charles just left. Uh, Charles, attorney at law. Armin, uh, entrepreneur coordinator and instructor at MATC. James, director of Cave Enterprise, uh, which includes the Burger King franchise. Uh, Jay, director of treasury from uh, North, Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company. And last but not least, uh, Bob Bernie, our current interim executive director for CTE. And the one thing I love about him, he is a retired professor from El Verno College. 2022, we have accomplished uh, so much and sometimes with uh, companies and corporations, uh, growth can be an issue. And I think we have experienced that considering we were uh, at a standstill for quite a few years, uh, regrouping ourselves from uh, the passing of Donna Rogers. But in 2022, we have um, touched or instructed over 200 kids. We, are, we have been into uh, five schools. Let's see if I can remember. Uh, Nova, McDowell, Holy Redeemer, Story, the Aspire program, and we did a short uh, three-week course at uh, MATC, which was fun. Uh, come in uh, January, we will be into probably eight to ten schools. So we have been blessed with grants um, that we have been giving by... Greater Milwaukee, I always have to look for Bob for my answers. Greater Milwaukee Foundation and the Wisconsin, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. So, you know, we are blessed uh, 
of the things we've been able to accomplish considering where once, uh, where once we were. So, um, what can you do? Pretty simple and easy. Uh, we need contacts um, into schools, companies, corporations. We need instructors. Um, I'm probably going to be short one or two instructors, instructors who can go out and teach our curriculum. Uh, and my great retired professor does a great job of having taken all the stuff that Redon has had in the past to, um, to go forward. So he, he does a great job of doing that. Uh, of course, we can always use funding, uh, donations, but we also can use your time, your talent, and your treasures. So anything that you can do to assist us, uh, it would be great. You can see myself, Bob, or any of the board members. What's ahead for us? 2023. I, <laughs> we created an event in 2019 that was called the uh, Big Hat Soiree. And we did it in 2019. That was in honor of Radonna. It, it's her event where we give homage and honor her. Uh, because if you know Redonna, there's two things she liked to do. She liked to wear big hats and she liked to dance. So we had the first one uh, at the Marcus Center for Performing Arts in the Bradley Pavilion. And of course, <laughs> our second one was scheduled in uh, May of 2020, but that didn't happen. So we finally got the second one rescheduled. It's going to be May. Uh, it's on our website, May of uh, 2023. And it will be back at the uh, Bradley Pavilion, and it's, it's a great setting if you haven't been there because it overlooks the river. And if you go to our website, you'll see the, the picture of all these, I think 80% women who got on their big hats and everything else, and it was a great time. So, and we also will be honoring a um, entrepreneur. We have not uh, gotten to that process because we need to get past this date, but uh, our first one we honored the developers of uh, Sherman uh, Phoenix, was our uh, first uh, honorees. So uh, I thank you all for coming. Make sure I got all my notes. Bob, did I miss anything? <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> Bob Bernie, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is one of my favorite moments. Standing next to Douglas because we work so closely together. And uh, this afternoon, I heard so many inspiring stories about uh, people that believe in Milwaukee and believe in young people and believe in their families. And Douglas um, is, is someone that, I, I, I wonder how he does it. <laughs> because we've talked about being blessed by so many things. I believe that, uh, the Center for Teaching Entrepreneurship. <laughs> okay, that's Douglas. He's uh, always working. <laughs> uh, the Center for Teaching Entrepreneurship and Milwaukee and Wisconsin is blessed to have Douglas Kelly. And every now and then, Douglas will talk about himself. You notice. He hardly says a word about himself because he's so concerned about what, what can I do to help other people and, and young people. So here's, here's my little story. So <laughs> I've already told it once this week. Uh, when we met with the uh, people from Strive, I, I, Douglas is not talking about himself. And I said, well, Douglas, you know, introduce yourself and let people know about you. So here, here's the Douglas story. Douglas told me, this was uh, a few years ago, he says, you know, when I meet somebody new and I go to a new organization, the first thing I talk about is CTE and the need for young people to develop their entrepreneurial and their money management skills and to believe that there's a good future for them. And then Douglas said, and then people will say, well, okay, that's, that's nice, but you know, what do you really do? And Douglas says, well, I also am a vice president of sales for WNOV, and I also am a real estate consultant. And I said, 
Well, that's what I do, and the reason that I talk to you and mention that I am the chair of the board of directors for CTE is because that's who I am. And I want you to know first who I am, and later I'll tell you what I do. So Douglas, thank you so many times for all the effort and dedication that you place in CTE and helping youth in Milwaukee. Thank you. You know what, I forgot one other board member. Jerry, Vice President from uh, Chase Bank. <laughs> you weren't here earlier. Um, one other thing, um, we order so, I, well, I should say I order so much food. Uh, I made sure that they provided us with uh, to-go containers. So please uh, help yourself, the to-go containers are over there. Make sure you please take those brownies. Uh, I've had two and they are very delicious. And my board members, do not run out the door because we got to do a quick breakdown of uh, this room. So don't run out the door. But again, thank you all. Uh, have a happy holiday. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you.